What is love actually? And that's what we want to get clear in this session. What the heck is even love truly? And I need you to be intuitive and imaginative with this and let go of all your concepts of love as a human mind. All the Disney movies, all the programming, all the broken relationships. Love has got nothing to do with relationships, by the way. Maybe that makes it easier for you. Love has got nothing to do with relationships. So let's have a bit of an origin story assessment of how love emerged. So I've also I've already explained that reality exists timelessly before it became anything. But love actually has a beginning and an end. How did love begin? Picture to the best of your ability this indescribable void, this absolute reality before anything can be said about anything, before there's any consciousness to experience anything. That reality, timeless, prior to any experience. Imagine in this sort of infinite void of infinite potential, but nothing being manifest yet, not even stars, not even space, not even time. The closest you could get in an imagination would be space. But it's, it's still very deceiving because absolute infinite reality is not space. Space is still a con concept. It's a construct. But as a picture or an analogy of infinite reality, it will do. It's the best we've got in our human terms. Okay, but if you can, if you have a sense of actual reality, then go there. If not, then picture infinite space without stars, without celestial bodies, without levels or consciousness, just an infinite space. Now, this space holds the potential for every possible experience or manifestation, but it's got nothing in it just yet. Nothing is activated. There's no kinetic aspect yet. There's only the static, timeless aspect of this one infinite reality. Now, the first thing that emerged as part of this timelessness is awareness. You could say that this infinity became intelligent. It became aware. And herein lies the explanation for why the next step of manifestation is love. Again, not human love. Don't think in these dualistic terms. Love is just the word. Don't care about the word. What is it trying to point to? What is love actually? And that's what we want to get clear in the session. What the heck is even love truly? And I need you to be intuitive and imaginative with this. And let go of all your concepts of love as a human mind. All the Disney movies, all the programming, all the broken relationships. Love has got nothing to do with relationships, by the way. Maybe that makes it easier for you. Love has got nothing to do with relationships. Your concept of relationships, anyway. Again, I'll get into this. We'll get more down to earth. But for now, let go of any concept of love as having anything to do with a man and a female, or a man and a man, or a female and a female. It's got nothing to do with the human form. If you eliminate this idea of human form, then what would the word love mean for you? What would it point to? Now we're getting more real with what it actually structurally means. What is love if there are no human beings in the entirety of the universe? There are no human forms anywhere in the universe. There are no relationships anywhere in the universe. Then what is that which we point to with the word love. What is it trying to point to beyond all the human things? And now you're getting closer to God's love already. He can already notice when you're dropping all the duality, the polarities, the human stuff, and you contemplate the true meaning of love, you are taking your consciousness already into a deeper vibration, closer to actual God-like love may not be quite there yet. <laughs> and in a sense, it's an infinite journey of, of attunement to this original love. But you can get a better sense of it because you're clear of some of the filters and associations. 
and you're pondering purely like a child would, what is actually meant by love? And now we go back to this infinite reality, this infinite void, that becomes aware of its own infinite reality. And when you have awareness of oneness, the kinetic result, the aura of that is love. I'll repeat that. When singularity, when singleness, when oneness is aware that it is one, one only, that all is itself, the emanation of that, the energy that gets produced in that alchemy between absolute potential and the intelligence of awareness, of free will, then the first activation of that infinite potential is the substratum energy of love that we call love. It's not love, it's just a word. But the energy that, it, this is the first Big Bang. This is the original metaphysical Big Bang. It's when awareness touched base with its own infinite unity and it, it became aware of its oneness. What was born out of that fusion was a universal kinetic energy, the first activation of infinite potential. That is an energy that will form the foundation for any illusion, any perception, any expression, any manifestation, which we call love or God's love. So God essentially is a combination of awareness and that essential beingness of love, that essential energy of love, that essential presence of love. The symbiotic combination of that intelligence, that awareness, that ability to shape, mold, choose, realize, be aware of, plus the energy that got released when it first realized there is only itself. There is love. You, by definition, love anything that you see as yourself. By definition. It's only the things you dislike that you don't want to be part of yourself or what you perceive as other self that you have to try to practice to love. But anything you truly believe is yours, you love automatically. Now, you may have a love-hate relationship with it conceptually, but instinctively, anything that you think is you, you love. There is a oneness with it. So even on a, as above, so below, on a microcosmic, distorted human level, if we will, anything you feel is your possession, you love, you protect, you feel at one with. Anything you believe is you, you love, you protect, you want more of it, you want more for it, you want to defend it. Now, this is all within the realm of duality, but the same principle is effectively at play within your consciousness right now. Whatever you think of as you, you love. Whatever you think of as not you, if you're a good person, you try to love it, but it's easier said than done. Because you see it as not you. But this infinite original awareness realized there's this infinite potential and all that could ever possibly be is me. The result, the emanation of that, the quantum reactor reaction that happened, the aura that was created, the metaphysical Big Bang that set the stage, that produced the essence of the God level for then everything else to be conceived out of, is all due to an awakeness to or an awareness of the indescribable, indisputable, inescapable oneness of it all. So how could you love and be loved as God loves? What would that require from you? It would require one of two ways. I'll discuss the two primary paths to this divine love. One is the diminishment of self into oblivion meaning annihilate your idea of self altogether, become nothing. And the other path is expand your sense of self to become everything, 
to leave no stone unturned to become all inclusive. Now there arises problems when you diminish yourself, but you don't take it all the way. Low self-esteem issues, false Buddhist kind of, I bow to everyone, I don't kill a single fly, but I'm still not enlightened and I won't ever be because I think too lowly of myself. If you're trying the path of self-annihilation and you fail, that's how you fail. If you try the path of self-expansion and you fail, you fail by having this inflated ego, this inflated arrogant distortion that still battles with its sense of reality. And it's like, well, why isn't everything just happening the way that I think it should happen? And blah, blah, blah. So there are traps on both sides of this equation. And one trap isn't better than the other per se. The self-diminished one, the low self-esteem one, is not any better than the inflated ego one. If anything, the inflated ego one has more of a chance to be popped because it causes more chaos around it. It causes more reflection around it. Because who's going to reflect this nice little Buddhist guy who's never going to get enlightened anyway because he thinks too lowly of himself? No one's going to reflect him. He's nice. He can clean the hallways. He's so sweet. Oh, maybe we'll get him a Christmas bonus. But the guy who is arrogant, who has an inflated ego, who hasn't quite made it yet to I am everything, it's just like, oh, I am a lot of things, but there's some things I'm not. Therefore, I need to require. That guy, he'll get slapped in the face sooner or later by life, by karma, by other people. He'll get reflected. Nobody likes him. So if anything, maybe it's better to go that route. <laughs> but either way, I think you get the point. If you want to be one with everything, you either have to be nothing or everything. And ultimately, these are the same things. Now, you don't have to, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you should embark upon a linear gradual path where you slowly, slowly become more and more and more and more and more until you're everything. Or where you slowly, slowly like eliminate your ego until you become nothing. These can be realized simultaneously, perfected in each moment of naked awareness, of letting life be as it is, letting the energy of God of this moment be as it is. Therein you will realize the absolute completion of confidence and humility of I'm everything and I am nothing, or all there is is God. Because essentially what you want to arrive at through I am nothing is that therefore all there is is God as it is, not as I think it is, not because there is a table in the, in the hallway and I'm aware of this table in the hallway. What is is a table in the hallway? No, those are concepts. When I say living life as it is or suchness, what suchness truly means, it's not well, this is a couch and it's present in the now. Oh, and my body's wearing this little outfit and that's what is now. That's not as it is, that's still in your mind. As it is, is empty of any articulation. As it is, is naked present acceptance. No argument, no opinion, no idea about anything. That's why this requires the greatest courage. The sages of this earth are the most courageous because they've sacrificed anything that could be identified as themselves. Everyone fights, oh, I don't want to lose my money. Well, how does that even compare? That's nothing. You can lose all your money. It doesn't compare to losing yourself. It's on a completely different bracket of existence of courage and honor. If you love God hard enough, if you love God completely enough, you will rise above these petty fears that all pertain to this concept of I'm a little human being, this lump of flesh, and I need to survive, and this is me, and that's them. You don't want to live in that world, my friends, trust me. I mean, you don't even have to trust me. Look at your own life when you do. It sucks. It's a terrible place to be. It's not fun. It's far removed from the Garden of Eden. It's a sinful way of living. Sin simply means mistake. To commit a sin means to commit a mistake. Where does all mistaking begins? Mistaken identity, mistaken perception. If we can correct the mistaken perception of yourself, you will no longer sin. Even if you're doing the same things you used to before, physically speaking, or almost the same thing. You're not sinning. One person can do one thing and sin. Another person could do the same thing and not sin. It depends on the state that inspired the action. There is no hard rule book for this is bad and this is good. It's impossible. It doesn't work that way. Only humans think it works that way. 
one person could commit the same action that is frowned upon by an unenlightened society, but it could have been inspired by love. And it could be a sinless action. Whereas someone could be performing a holy action, greatly renowned and loved and appreciated by all of the people. But if it came from a distorted sense of self, it's a sinful act, no matter how good. So sin means to make a mistake. To sin means to be in mistaken perception. Correct your mistaken perception and you're free of sin and you're in the Garden of Eden. You don't eat from the apple of knowledge, right? You don't assume knowledge. You don't know anything. You remain innocent, naked awareness, and disconnect you to this God energy, aka what we call love. It's not love because love is a word. But what the word points to, that genuine underlying energy, which is the same in everything and everywhere and all the time and in all thoughts and all feelings and all emotions, that presence that is constant, unequivocally constant, equal, is God energy, it is love. And again, it's born out of the awareness that there cannot be anything but yourself, but itself. 